Okay, we're gonna continue with data structures today. Moving away from the standard library. So we're gonna cover the union find data structure, which you've already seen in the algorithms course. Uh, we're also gonna look at some applications of that and then we're gonna look at range queries. Uh, we'll view a couple of different methods for that, including square root decomposition and segment trees. So what is union find? Uh, it is a data structure for maintaining a disjoint set union, often just called DSU. Uh, so you have n items and you want to be able to split them up into sets. At first everything is in its own set and then you can use two commands, find, which helps you find what, uh, what set a particular item is in, and then union allows you to uh, say, okay, everything in the set that X is in is now in the set that Y is in. So you will unite these two sets. So the find function just returns an integer which represents uh, which set the item is in. And if two items are in the same set, the, the find function should return the same integer for those two numbers. So if we look at the example we have here, the sets we have are one and four together and then we have three, five, six, and two. So find of, find of one returns one, and because four is in the same set, find of four also returns one. And then same for the next set, we have find of three returns five, find of five returns five, find of six returns five, and then find of two returns two. And the way we check if two items are in the same set is we just check if find A equals find B. <coughs> the union command will merge the sets. So if we look at the sets we already have and we say unite four and two, then the set one, four will merge with the set two, and we will have the set one, two, four. The other set will not change at all. Also, if we unite items that are in the same set, then nothing will happen. So like here, un union of three and six, three and six are already in the same set here, so nothing will change. Finally, by uniting two and six, uh, we will merge the two remaining sets together and everything will be in the same set here. Okay, so how do we implement this? We use a quick union with path compression. And the good thing about this is that the implementation is extremely simple. And also, it is extremely efficient. The time complexity is near con constant, but not completely constant. If you've ever heard of the Ackermann function, then the and you know that it grows really, really fast, like super exponentially. Uh, if you take the inverse of the Ackermann function, that's the time complexity of union find. So realistically, you'll never have uh, more than 10 operations occur in each, each command here. Uh, 
So what we start with is we create the vector, which tells us uh, what is the parent of this item. So for each item we know, we kind of have an edge going to another item saying, this is my parent. And we start by having everything pointing to itself. So every item is its own parent. Now to find an item, we just, or to find the representative, we just check, okay, am I my own parent? Then I am the representative. Otherwise we move up to the parent of the item. But uh, what we do here is we, we compress in this command. So here we find the top value uh, so think if if think if we would have to take a couple of steps to reach the parent, then this here would compress the path to just one step by reassigning the parent of the current item. Um, so maybe I can get a picture of this for you. So suppose we call find on this node here. Let's give it the number three, two, and one. Then what the command will do is it will uh, recursively go up and find the value that is its own parent. So that's this one. This is its own parent. And it returns that all the way down, and each node in this path will have its parent reassigned. Uh, so this one will reassign its parent to the top, so it doesn't change because it's always pointing there. But this one will stop pointing to 2, and now point to the top value which we found. So we have effectively compressed the path, and now we only need to take one step to reach for all further commands. And then it just returns the value uh, it was assigned. For uniting, we just uh, find the representative of x and we make that one point to the representative of y. So the representative of x used to point to itself, but now it will point to the representative of i and y, and then they are connected. And if you're in a hurry and you want a compact version of this code, you can write it up like this. It's really short, but it's a bit harder to read. This is uh, essentially an if statement here. It's called a ternary operator. Now, what are the applications of this? Uh, mostly it's graphs because we're working with uh, a collection of disjoint sets. And when you add an edge between two nodes, you are connecting their sets, you're merging their sets. So all the nodes which are reachable from node A and all the nodes are that are reachable from node B, they will now be in the same set and they're all reachable from each other. So if we take a look at this example, we have the sets 1, 4, 7, 3, 5, 6, and 2. These are items or collections. And then we apply the command union of two and five. So we're adding an edge between node two and node five. And then we merge their sets. 
we add the edge between them and two is now reachable from all the nodes that were reachable from fives. We union six and two, we will add the edge, but the sets remain the same. And let's look at this problem. All right, so we have uh, some people using social networking to make friends. Uh, and they're addicted and they're collecting virtual friends and so we're supposed to uh, tell the size of the the friend network and we assume every friendship is mutual So if we look at the sample, we have uh, Fred and Barney become friends, then Barney and Betty become friends, and then Betty and Wilma become friends. And after each command, we say, what is the size of their friendship network? So everyone has just size one at the start. When we connect Fred and Barney with each other, they have size 2. When we connect Barney and Betty, we have added Betty to the friend network that Fred and Barney had. So there's 3 now. And then Wilma gets added later, so it's 4. Uh, if this command appeared before this command, then the output would be 2, 2, 4 because we would not have connected uh, Betty and Wilma to Fred and Barney at the start. Okay, so let's solve this problem. And I'm going to get the union find code, which I showed you. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to modify our data structure so it can support size. And I think the easiest method to do that is just to add another vector which uh, manages the size. So we'll add another vector here. We'll call it count, and we'll need to initialize it. And then each item just starts uh, in its own set, so everything should start as one. Okay, so our find function shouldn't change at all. It's just the union unite function which changes okay so what I'm gonna do is I'm first gonna get the values of the representatives so let's find of X and then Y representative is find of Y okay and if these are the same representatives, then we're in the same set. So 
so we'll just return. Uh, otherwise, we need to connect them. So we have this is x representative, and this is y representative. Okay, and when we connect them, we need to update the size. So we have made the y representative the parent, so we're going to change the size of the y representative. So count of yr, we're going to add everything that's in the x representative set. Okay, so now we have uh, added size to our data structure. We just need to have a way of querying it. So let's add a function called size of component. And we'll just have to find the representative of the item and return its count. Okay, any questions so far? All right, then let's move on to the program itself. So first we'll get uh, the number of test cases and then an integer f in each test case. Okay, so we need test cases and a loop to go through those. Oops. And then we'll have the number of friendships, uh, I call it M since this is edges in a graph essentially. Okay, and our problem here is we get strings, but we want to use integers in our union find to index. So we need to map the strings to integers We'll add a map here and a counter to decide the ID of each person. Um, and we're going to create a union find data structure. Uh, how many? It's mm, at most 100,000, so that's 200,000 people at most. Will be no. Let's just go with four hundred thousand and a bit more. So if this is too much, then we'll get time limit exceeded or member limit exceeded, and we can reduce it. But it's a. Uh, it's not bad practice to to uh, add a bit on top. Just like have a bit more space than you need. Uh, because if you do it exactly, you're more likely to make an error in your calculation. Like maybe you made an error, you're off by one, and then your program fails because you exceed the arrays index capabilities. The um, it didn't quite follow the logic on on how you determine that size. The size. Uh, so I think we only need 200,000 because uh, you have two people in each line and the number of lines is at most 100,000. Sure, okay. But I'm just I'm just adding a bit on top. If it's too much, we'll uh, if it's too much, we'll get memory limit exceeded or time limit exceeded. 
but I think like th this should work. Just two hundred thousand, I guess. And we can just try that. But uh, we m we might as well make it larger. Like it's not gonna harm us in any way. It's uh just a practice of better safe than sorry. So if we do it like this, then what we need to do now is go through all the friendships. And for each friendship we read two names, A and B. And here we need to uh, convert these strings into numbers. So we're going to use this counter for that. So what we're going to do is we're going to check, does our map already contain this name? Have we seen this name before? If we haven't seen it before, then what we're going to do is we're going to assign this name a number. Like so, and then we're gonna increase that number afterwards. So maybe this is clearer. Okay, same for the other name. So now we have added them to our map if we haven't seen them before and then we can get numbers for our names x and y Oops. like so and then we can apply our union find using these numbers so we got the numbers x and y we want to unite them And then we want to write out the size after the union. So we'll call our function, plug in either number, doesn't matter which one, in the same set. And that's everything we need to do. Sample. Two, three, and four. Yeah. Did I make too many lines? My output? No. Okay, let's just try submitting this. different compiler so I need to comment this line out and accept it okay so any questions about this problem using size and union find Let's move on to range queries. Okay, so this is a very common subtask in uh, that you need to do in many problems. So you have some array of size n and 
you're given two endpoints, you're given a range of the array, and you want to uh, determine the maximum, the minimum, the sum, or, or some other uh, aggregate uh, over this range. And you want to be able to answer this efficiently, because you may need to do it quite, uh, quite often. So you don't you don't want to naively uh, just loop from i up to j and you know aggregate the values together. And sometimes you may like sometimes this is just a static array; the values don't change at all. And sometimes it's not. So we want to look at both of these cases. How can we handle them? And we'll start with the simple version which is a static array. There's no updating, the array comes in, just the values come in once, and then they're just fixed for the rest of the program. So here we have an array, and if we take the sum, zero up to six, then that will be all of these values added together, we'll get 33. If we go from two to five, it's just 7 plus 8 plus 5 plus 9, we get 29. From 2 up to 2, that's just one value, so that's just a 7. Okay, and how can we do this fast? Preferably, we want something in constant time. And what we're going to do is we're just going to simplify the, the queries that we support. So in, instead of supporting a uh, query from any starting index will just support queries that start at zero and go to some end index. And then we can calculate uh, a query that starts at index i by subtracting uh, everything that comes before i. So we'll have this here query. It's equal to just taking the entire thing here up to j and then subtracting everything in front of index i. So that's from 0 up to i minus 1. So now what we're only inter interested in are prefix sums of the array. So it's sums that start, uh, start at the front and then you add it up over time as you reach the end of the array. And there are only n of these in total, one for each index. So we'll just do some pre-computation. First we start with one, we put that in index in the first index of our array, and then we'll add the zero, we'll add the seven, we'll add the eight, then the five, then the nine, and then the three. Okay, so it takes all of n time to do this pre-processing, and after that we can query in constant time, because all we have to do is index into this new array we have, which is constant time, uh, twice. So now the question is, can we, can we change this to support updating? So it's not just a static array. And the answer is no, sadly. We'll have to do some modification in order to support updating. So let's say we now need to update the element, just any element in the array but we also want to be able to still sum over the range and do it quickly. So yeah, here we have the sum is 33 in total, and we want to be able to change this eight to a minus two. Okay, so the sum should change. Now it's 23. So how do we do this? We we want to uh, 
avoid iterating too much. We'll have to we'll have to look through the uh, array. But we want to do less of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to split the array into buckets. So if we say k equals two, it's the size of the buckets. Then we'll split them up like so. And now we have around n divided by k buckets. And we'll store, we'll, we'll pre-process by storing the sum of elements inside each bucket. So now we'll have these buckets. Sum is 1 for the first one. The next is 7 plus 8, and then we have 5 plus 9. And then just uh, one item in the last bucket, because it's at the end. So now when we update, we not only update the, the value in the array, but we also uh, take the difference and update the, the bucket itself as well. Or we can just uh, recompute it even just by iterating. So suppose we update now 3 with negative 2. We can now just loop over this bucket and find out that 7 minus 2 is 5. And then we have uh, updated everything we need to process this quickly when we query. The time complexity of this is O of k, so it's just the size of the bucket. Uh, you can do it in O of 1 by using the difference. So uh, we changed 8 to negative 2, the difference or like the, the amount we changed it by is negative 10, so we could just subtract that directly from the bucket instead of iterating over it. Uh, but it doesn't really matter in regards to time complexity later on. Uh, and we'll cover that, why that happens later. Uh, when we query, we we will have some start index and an end index. And sometimes our buckets will be completely within these indices. And then instead of uh, iterating through each item in the bucket, we'll just take the sum of the bucket as a whole. So we, we're jumping over uh, intervals of size k. Uh, so if we, for example, query 1 to 5, uh, we can, as you see here, we can remove uh, iterating over the 7 and 8 individually and just take the bucket of size 15 instead. Same with the next bucket, we'll just take the entire bucket instead of iterating through it. And then we'll just have done uh, three operations instead of five. The sum will be the same. Now, the time complexity of this is, well, we only have to look at two buckets, like inside them. And worst case, we're looking at uh, every single item except one. And at most, we have to consider uh, every bucket except the two ends. So that's around n divided by k buckets, like the, almost all the buckets. So in total, it's going to be n divided by k plus 2k. And what we want here is we want to minimize this value. So this is the time complexity. How do we minimize this? And as it turns out, the best value is the square root of n, because then n divided by k and k are equal. So now we have updating in big O of square root of n and querying in big O square root of n. That's why it's called the square root decomposition. 
because of the time complexity. And this is a, a very powerful technique. You can do you can do a lot of different things with uh, arrays uh, with this technique. And we're going to look at the problem supercomputer. So here we have uh, a computer. Yeah, we just have bits. It's just bits, not integers. So we want to be able to query how many one bits there are, which is just the sum. So if there's an array with zero and ones, this is just going to be the sum. And the array is of size 10 to the power of 6 at most. And then there are 10 to the power of 5 queries. Uh, the queries are flip. So we can flip a bit. And then we can query with C L to R. Which counts the number of bits inclusive. Okay. The ranges are inclusive. So this is called supercomputer. So first we have to read n and the number of items and then the number of queries. and queries read that in now we want to choose our k for the size of the buckets that was the square root of n we'll round it down okay and then we need two arrays one for the bits and then one which uh, is for the buckets, the sum in the buckets. So we'll have bits and then uh, let's see yeah, I think this is correct. So this is the number of buckets you'll need. Again, you could have more buckets uh, if you want it. It wouldn't really change anything. So we'll go through the queries. And it first starts with a character which is the operation we'll be doing. Okay, let's start with flips. Those are the easier queries. So if it's a flip, we need one integer. 
and in the problem the indices are yeah they're one based okay so we have to change them to zero based so we subtract and then we just need to check okay if it's a one we're flipping it to a zero and reducing the sum by one so if the current bit here is one the current bit is one we flip it to a zero and we reduce the sum in the bucket so that would be bucket x divided by k and otherwise we flip it to a one and increase the value in the bucket okay so this should handle the flips uh, and now for the queries So we get two integers now, left and right. And we need to change them to zero base indexing. So subtract one. And then we want to iterate and collect the sum. So what we're gonna do is we're going to go through every single bucket and we'll handle the three possible cases uh, that can occur. So that's uh, the bucket is completely within the range. The bucket is partially within the range. And finally, it's completely out of the range and won't be included at all. So Let's go through the buckets, starting with bucket zero. And then we want the start index of this bucket and the end index of this bucket. So we can compare it with our range. So the start index is going to be uh, k times b, so if b is 0, then this will be 0. If this is 1, it'll be k. And then the end index should be uh, the starting index of the next bucket, minus 1. So that would be k times b plus 1, minus 1. Okay. And then we have to find out which case we're in. So let's start with the, the bucket is completely within. So then L has to be less than or equal to the start index, X. And Y has to be less than or equal to the right. The end index is less than or equal to the right index. Okay. If this is the case, we can add the entire bucket to our sum. Okay. Now let's do the case where it's completely outside the range. So that's essentially just the, the inverse of this. So we'll have y is less than l and r is less than x so here our end index is less than the starting index of the range or 
the end index of the range is less than the start index of our bucket. So we're either completely uh, to the left of it, in the front of it, or completely to the right of it, or behind it. Okay, if this is the case, we just do nothing. So I'll just have an empty block here. Finally, if we are partially within then we have to loop uh, in our bucket and let's see, this is gonna be the maximum of L and X. So if we are intersecting the range at the left, then the X will be the greater value. If we're intersecting uh, at the end or on the right, the L will be the greater value. Okay, and then the end should be similar, but the minimum. So that's minimum of R and Y. And then we could say if this bit is set, we'll add one. Okay, so that should handle the query. And then all we have to do is output each time we query. So output the sum here. Uh, yeah, everything starts at zero according to the description. should be complete so let's try submitting Success. Uh, so, any questions about this problem? Okay, so We submitted this and we see it's, you know, it's half a second uh, in C++, so it's maybe not the fastest. And if the input constraints were a bit larger, then uh, square root decomposition would be too slow.
So if, if, if n were a bit larger or we had more queries, then this would be just too slow. We need something, we need something a bit faster. So can we maybe sacrifice some power that the uh, square decomposition provides with uh, speed? So before, when we went from uh, from the prefix sums to to square root decomposition, we threw away speed to gain power. We we wanted to be able to update. Now we want to do the opposite. So we're gonna use what's called uh, a segment tree, and it's essentially just a binary tree where the nodes have ranges in the area associated with them. So we'll create a node for for each item in the array. And then we'll uh, join adjacent nodes with each other. So here, 1 and 0 will both have the same parent node, which will contain their sum 7 and 8. We'll have the same parent node, which contain their sum 5 and 9, same thing. And then for the next step, we'll join these adjacent nodes. So their sum will be 16, and it will be in their parent node here. The 14 and this 3 uh, looks kind of weird because we didn't have a power of 2. So we have this uh, odd one out at the end. Uh, but we'll take their sum and put that in node here, and then finally we'll have the root, which, you know, covers everything. Okay, so each vertex here contains the sum of some some uh, range segment in the array. So if we look at uh, this node here, that's the first four values. So here is a code which creates a segment tree for an array like this. Uh, we'll have uh, we'll have left and right children for each node, and then the node will have three values: uh, a from and a to, which says which indices they cover cover all the indices from the value from up to the value to. And then we also have the value, which is just the sum. Uh, and then this build function here will return a segment tree for the array provided within the range provided. So if you're calling this in your main function, you would plug in 0 and n minus 1 here. So first of all, if, if L is greater than R, we have just nothing. We're done. So we return null. Uh, otherwise, we'll create the node which covers this range. And in the case that uh, L and R are the same value, we have reached uh, just a single item. So we'll just uh, set the value of the item to the in, uh, value at that index. Otherwise, we want uh, to cut our range in two parts. So we'll find the middle, and then we'll build a node uh, on the as the left child, which goes from uh, L up to the middle. And then similarly for the right child from n plus one up to the right index. And if both of these, uh, if the build functions for both of these return an actual node, then it'll not be null, and we will want to add that to our sum here. So how do we use the segment tree after we built it? 
let's start with querying. So we want to give it a range and collect the correct sum in the least amount of steps. So let's go from index 0 up to index 5. It should be all of these nodes. We can reduce all of these uh, up to their parents, like so. Uh, and then the 1 and 15 we can reduce up to their parent, so like so. So this is the, the minimum number of nodes we would need uh, to get the correct sum. So 16 plus 14 is 30. And you see how, how we only need to consider uh, very few vertices to get the entire uh, the sum that we want. We want some easy way to find them. So what we'll do is we'll start at the top, the root. And then we'll propagate uh, a question down, like so. Uh, if, however, our node is completely within the range we requested, we'll add that to the sum. So like the 16 will be completely within the range. So we stop there and we just take its sum. For the other one, we move it down again. And now our f the f node with 14 is completely within the range. So that gets added to the sum. The three, however, is completely outside the range. So we uh, just return zero for that. We don't add it to our sum. Just drop it completely. So then we have code that looks like this. Uh, if we're at a null pointer, we return zero. If uh, if we are completely within the range requested, so our from value is greater or equal to this L, or less L is less than or equal to the from value, and again, the two value is less than or equal to R. And then we just return the value of this node. Okay. Then we have two cases of being completely outside. Our to value could be to the left of the range, or our from value could be to the right of the range. Both of these do the same thing. You just return zero, because then won't, won't, it won't affect our sum. Uh, otherwise, we just propagate this down to our children. So you ask your left child and your right child, and you sum the values they provide to get your result. How do we update? So we want to change uh, this 8 to a 5. So we just recalculate the parent all the way to the top. So the first thing we have to do is we have to check if we're at a null pointer. Then we just return nothing. Uh, if we are completely outside the, the range that we're changing, which is just one value, then we don't want to change it at all. We just return the value itself. Uh, It's this case we're interested in here, because this is the case where we are at the the index, no, the node that we wanted to change the value of is here. So there we update the value here. Uh, the other case is we, we are a parent of this value, so we want to recalculate our value here. So 
So with this, we can build a segment tree, we can query the range with a segment tree, and we can update a single value. And now I ask how, like, what is the time complexity of these operations? Building the segment tree is O of n. What about querying and updating? Any suggestions? Uh, this would be a log. Yeah. A complexity. Yeah. Yeah. It's a binary tree. The the height of the tree is at most log of n. So. It's log of n. And the thing you can use segment trees for is you have these associative operations uh, like min, max, gcd, uh, addition, multiplication, not subtraction, not division. So um, Associative operations. Let's so that's where is the general term? Yeah. That's this here. X times Y times set afterwards is equal to x times y times z. So the, the order in which you apply the operation does not matter. And yeah, I, I, I prefer this functional notation here. Uh, because you'll be using this as functions in segment tree, usually, like GCD. So you can use this, you can use segment trees for any associative operation like this. And it uh, doesn't require a lot of modif modification for that. It's mostly just plugging in the function. Uh, one thing you need to be careful of is for addition, our identity here is zero. That does not change the result. For multiplication, it would be one. You don't want to put a zero, you're doing multiplication. And you just have to, you know, be careful of what your identity is for your operation. Uh, yeah, one more thing. Uh, there is a more powerful version of segment tree, uh, which is called segment tree with lazy propagation. Uh, it can allow you to do things like uh, updating a range. So if you instead want to add 23 to all the values between index 7 and 20, then you need segment trees with lazy propagation to do that. Or you could use square root decomposition. So like I said, we're sec when we're moving from square root decomposition to segment trees, we are sacrificing power. And I, on the spot, I can't think of a thing that a segment tree can do that a square root in composition. No, I, I mean, uh, things a, a square root in composition can do. Yeah, square root in composition can do the things that segment trees can do, but not necessarily vice versa. And you can Google segment trees with lazy propagation if you want to learn more about this. There are also things called interval trees, which uh, can be used for debuggers, for example. So these are not like competitive programming specific data structures. These uh, come up all the time in just computer science when you're making software. What's, uh, can you think of a situation where you'd want to use the 
the uh, square root decomposition instead? Uh, instead of the segment tree? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, for example, let's say you want, oh, I actually have a problem, which is a good example. Let me find it real quick. Uh, On here, so here you have a sequence of numbers, just an array, and you have a K query, uh, which is just something they call this triple I J K. And so here you want to return the number of elements greater than K in within the range. So, so you're not doing, uh, you're not doing this, uh, just a sum or, or some associative operation here. You're, you're asking for how many elements in the range are greater than this value. And uh, yeah, you can't use a segment tree here, but you can do this with square root decomposition. It's uh, it's trickier than the, like it's it's more complicated square root decomposition than the one I showed you, but but the idea hey, the, the idea is the, the same. With a segment tree, couldn't you just store each node like the sum of of the things in the segment that are greater than k yeah like, but, i mean like but, a k will keep changing yeah yeah k changes that's the problem if it were fixed you could do it and you also you could probably do it uh so this online in the name this means that they they require you to answer each query instantly normally normally you could process the entire input and uh then at the end output everything but because you need to uh, do this this XOR thing with your last answer, uh, you need to have found this value before you move on to the next query. So, so maybe you could use a segment tree if this wasn't the case. But 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 this is just an example. Like here, you have something that um, changes uh, or isn't an associative operation, which makes using a segment tree harder or impossible it just isn't the correct data structure for the problem uh yeah so let's use a segment tree for supercomputer and see the difference yeah i already had that open here okay Okay, so I'm gonna get the segment tree code I provided you. Yeah, so here you could for this problem, you could also do it like this because you're just flipping a bit. Uh, I just have the index here, but I don't provide it with a value. And you can flip it like this, or you can, you know, flip it by subtracting it from one. Because if it's a zero, it's going to be a one. If it's a one, it's going to be a zero. Okay, so the rest is 
basically very simple because we're just calling our data structure to handle everything. We need the vector for the bits and then we will just call our build function to create the segment tree. Like I said, you put in 0 and n-1 for the entire array. And then we just handle the queries. And we have two operations. We had flip, which was f. And that was one value, converted to zero base, and then just call our update function with the segment tree we created and the index we want to flip. Okay. Otherwise, this is a range query. Add our Change both to zero indexed, and then just output the result of calling our query function. So, really simple, if you already have this available to you. Wasn't much faster, but mm, would be noticeable if the input sizes were larger. Um, also, this implementation uh, uses nodes, like uh, pointers, to, and you have to allocate the memory a lot. Uh, there is another way to make segment trees to build them by just having an array, and then each index in the array represents a node and that runs much faster. Uh, if, you, if you look up implementation of segment trees, you can probably find one and you can see how it's implemented. Uh, it's just a, a matter of finding how to index properly within the array which marks the nodes. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for today. Yeah. So, any questions at the end? Um, the problem set oops, is up. Problem set three. Uh, there are six problems. One of them is worth two points because it is much harder, in my opinion. That's this one. Uh, the rest are one points, and you need three points for a full score. Then we have two bonus problems, uh, Kako hashing and disastrous downfall. Uh, one question, maybe. Uh, uh, tomorrow we have a uh, day, type of day. Yeah, you ha we have the problem session tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so how, how, how will that uh, go? Uh, so, you you will group up 
preferably just with the group you've been working with in the other problem sets. Uh, and we will have a sh short programming contest. Uh, it's essentially just you, you get a problem set from the topics we've covered so far. So the first three. And you have three hours to solve the problems provided. Uh, let me see. And yeah, it will be it will be like a contest. So I mean, you will see a scoreboard where you see how you know everyone else is doing. Uh, but the the rank, like where you end up on the scoreboard, it has no effect on the grade. So everybody will get the same grade essentially, uh, no matter how. Uh, or is it dependent on how many problems we yeah, solve? Yeah, you need you need to solve a minimum number of problems to get the full score. Okay, uh, and and something about only one person programming at a time. Yeah. Or, or is that uh, so? Only one person can uh, make the uh, programmers. How will that work? Yeah. So I I want you to emulate. Uh, how programming competitions are when you are, you know, together locally. So I want you to, yeah, I want you to discuss problems, and then, then you, one person, you know, will program. And I mean, you can have, you can do pair programming. You can all, you know, do it together. But I don't want you to be programming separately on different computers. Because we, each team should only have one computer. That's how it is uh, normally. Uh, yeah, it would it would be easier in person. Yeah. Uh, and thinking maybe for the like for practical purposes, like the, uh, everybody is is trying to program the uh, problems. The first yeah. person that just uh, solves it will post it. We are talking together at the same time. And just move to the next problem or something like that because yeah. it's like because you cannot see it's really hard if you cannot see the code you can you can share screen on discord okay yeah, yeah. maybe i'm kind of naive to yeah. yeah yeah you can you can you can share screen on discord it's just under uh, the disconnect button on the bottom left you can like share there you can select an application or or the screen itself like the monitor Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and preferably I would like you to be sharing your screen there, so so I can see also that you're programming. And then it's just you know the one that's sharing the screen is the one programming. It's it's easy to keep track of, you know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the problem session starts at one and is until four. Uh, there will be. I will put in slides for the strings optional problem set. Uh, yeah, so the fourth problem set comes out tomorrow, but uh, it's essentially the second to last problem set. I, I marked it as optional. You can do that instead of some other problem set if you want. Like that's your choice. Uh, but yeah, in the problem session, we'll have, it'll be very similar to the problem sets. You'll have five or six problems. Uh, they'll be, you know, around the same difficulty, uh, maybe easier. Uh, yeah, and don't be late because it starts at exactly one. I just put it in the system and it starts automatically. And you will have exactly three hours. Uh, I recommend that you uh, you discuss 
the problems. Like you read, you read all the problems first. Uh, try to find out what's the easiest one. Discuss what the solution to the problem is, and then one person pro goes to program that while the rest continue discussion. Uh, that is just, uh, in my opinion, the optimal method for these competitions. Uh, you can also, if you want, you can have one person looking at the problems and two doing the programming. That's also a good, good method, but, but don't. I, I wouldn't recommend everyone focus on the programming and I don't recommend everyone looking at different problems uh, unless you're 100% confident you can solve them by yourself. The greatest tool you have is, are your team members. You can discuss the problems with them, it will pr present you with new ideas and just make problem solving easier all around. This is why companies have teams, because people talk together and they come up with solutions faster and better that way. Two is okay. I mean, one is okay if you want to make uh, life hard, but, but three is the max. I just don't recommend being alone. So please, if you if you do not have a group member, uh, let me know. All right, if there are no more questions, then that's it for the lecture.